But one thing that is completely unreasonable and that you should never ask yourself to do is to sit down or stand up and immediately focus on something unless you're stressed about what you're looking at or you're very, very excited by it. If you're very stressed about some sort of information or a deadline, or you're very, very excited about something, you'll find that you can focus instantly just within a moment. And that's because of the deployment of neurochemicals like dopamine and norepinephrine that bring about our levels of alertness. However, most of us, including myself, will go to begin a work bout and we'll find that our mind doesn't quite engage at the level of depth and focus that we would like right off the bat. I've timed this and other studies have timed this in a more rigorous way. Mine is just what we call anic data. But so I've timed it for myself, but there are studies that have looked at this and the data point to the fact that even at our most heightened levels of focus, most people can only maintain focus before switching tasks for about three minutes, which is depressingly short period of time. However, you can extend that period of time. And I've talked about that in the episode on focus, but more importantly, when you sit down to start a work bout of any kind, any kind, expect that it would take about six minutes for you to engage these neural circuits. You wouldn't expect yourself to walk into the gym and do a PR lift or start running and do your best sprint or just head out the door without warming up at all. A, you know, a little walk jog at first or, you know, a few warm up sets. I mean, that's, we expect that. We, we are not surprised that we need that. And yet we sort of expect that our brain should be able to lock on and do work in a very focused way immediately. And that's just a ridiculous assumption. It's an unfair assumption, I should say. So assume that it will take about six minutes to engage in your work bout and that those neurochemical systems will take some time to rev up and, en and engage. The other things that I'm describing about lighting and screen positioning and posture, those will also help maximize your focus and will limit that ramp up time into a focused state. And I think what you'll find is that as you maximize your workspace, the time, the latency, as we say, to get into that focus will start to shorten. It'll especially start to shorten if you use tools to limit distraction. We will talk about distraction, but things like Freedom, which is a, an app, a, a free app that allows you to lock yourself out of the internet or turning off your phone, for instance. But even if you're doing work on your phone or that involves your phone or the internet, as many of us, including myself do, expect there to be a ramp up time for you to focus. There's another aspect of our vision that's absolutely critical for optimizing our workspace. And that has to do with this really interesting feature of our visual pathways in that it has two major channels. Those two major channels have names, although you don't have to remember the names. The first one is the so-called parvocellular channel, which is involved in looking at things at specific points in space and at high resolution or detail. And then there's the so-called magnocellular channel that's involved in looking at big swaths of visual space and at lower resolution. So you can think of the parvocellular system as kind of a high pixel density. Think about your most modern smartphone, the recent smartphone with the best, best camera. And think about the magnocellular system as being lower resolution, kind of an older smartphone, lower pixels, et cetera. You might ask, why would you want a system that's you know, low resolution? Well, the low resolution system is better at things like detecting motion and not so much at detail and vice versa. Now, again, you don't have to remember the names. What you do have to remember, however, is that you're going to create the maximum amount of alertness in your system, the maximum amount of ability to focus when you're system is in that parvocellular mode. When you're bringing your eyes to a common point, what we call avergence eye movement, V-E-R-G-E-N-C-E. -E -E. I've said this before on the podcast and people said virgin eye movement. No, vergence eye movement, as in convergence. Bringing your eyes to a single point in space will create a narrower aperture of a visual window, meaning your, your visual world actually shrinks, at least perceptually. Whereas when you relax your eyes and dilate your gaze, you can do this now by whatever environment you're in, trying and see without moving your head off to the side, above, below you, as broadly as possible. Maybe you can dilate your gaze so much that you can see yourself, your body in that visual environment. And you'll notice that your resolution of vision isn't nearly as high as when you do that virgin side movement. Virgin side movements are incredibly powerful for creating heightened states of alertness and focus. And indeed, they create heightened states of cognition, of thinking. And that's because your brain follows your vision in terms of focus. When we say, I can't focus, what we often are experiencing is an ability, an inability, excuse me, to not focus visually. Whereas when we are in a very focused state, we are in a state often where we can focus visually. Now we can also do this with our auditory system or to touch, et cetera. But right now we're just talking about the visual system. Now, in terms of workspace optimization, what this means is we never really want to be looking at a square or rectangle or target area for our work 
that is too far beyond our ears. How far is too far? Really, you want to try and keep the blinders on, or I should say the invisible blinders so that whatever you're looking at falls within the region of visual space in front of you that is present if you were to cup your hands and put them right next to your eyes. Now, this is a rough estimation, but I'm doing this now. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, I'm doing this now. I'm trying to simulate like a horse with blinders on. For those of you that are listening, just imagine me looking silly with my hands cupped near my eyes. But if we are to, for instance, look at a screen that's very, very big, and we're too close to it, or even if we're standing back from it, it's going to be hard for us to attend to everything within that screen space. So this is actually support for the idea of using a phone or a tablet or a laptop. Some, my laptop is about 15 inches in diameter, I think is the one that I have. Some are 13, some are 17. Some of you like to use big monitors. Make sure that whatever it is that you're looking at, if you want to remain focused, it doesn't extend too far beyond where your eyes are, the size of your head that is. So just think blinders on a horse. And actually that's the reason they put blinders on a horse so that they're not looking off into the periphery. Horses, unlike humans, don't have the same shaped pupil. They don't have a visual system that's organized in quite the same way. They mostly see in panorama, in magnocellar vision. And so those blinders are designed to keep their visual focus straight ahead. So they physically restrict it. Now, some people will actually go to lengths to further restrict their visual focus. They will do things like putting on a hoodie or wearing a hat, for instance, to restrict their visual window. And indeed that works quite well. But as we'll talk about in a moment, when you really restrict your visual window down to a very, very narrow portion of visual space, that actually changes the types of information that you are best at processing. And we'll talk about that in terms of something that's called the cathedral effect in a few moments. But for now, here's the principle. Make sure that whatever you're looking at is directly in front of you and doesn't extend too far out to the side. Once you get out to say six or 12 or certainly 18 inches on either side of your eyes, you are dilating your gaze. By definition, you're dilating your gaze. It's completely subconscious and it becomes very hard to maintain attention. Now, the caveat to this is that if you are going to look at a narrow space, a narrow window for any period of time, whether or not it's a book or a laptop or a tablet or a phone, those virgin's eye movements not only create alertness, but they also require energy. And they also can fatigue the eyes because there's a process called accommodation whereby the shape of your eye literally has to change so that the lens can move so that you can focus at that location. Accommodation is an incredible process, but it is a demanding one. And that's the reason that your eyes get tired when you focus on something for too long. So here's a principle extracted from the ophthalmology and neuroscience literature that you can adopt. For every 45 minutes, in which you are focusing on something like a phone or a tablet or a book page or your computer, you want to get into magnocellar panoramic vision for at least five minutes. And the way that I suggest to do this is actually to take a walk ideally outside. We're gonna talk about ambulation, about movement and about how that can maintain alertness throughout the day. So for every 45 minutes or so, try and get five minutes of relaxing your eyes. This is something that's not often done, especially in today's homeschooling and where people are, uh, where kids are going to school by Zoom and adults are working by Zoom. This is a serious problem. People are getting eye fatigue. They're getting headaches. Indeed, some people are getting migraines. They're having all sorts of issues, neck pain, much of that, if not all of that in some cases, can be alleviated by this 45 to five rule. For every 45 minutes of focused work that you do, get five minutes where you get outside or if you have to be indoors where you can dilate your gaze. Now, some of you may be saying, well, that spits in the face of your 90 minute rule. You're trying to, you've told us before that we should focus for 90 minutes. I would still want you to take breaks within those 90 minutes if you're looking at a narrow piece of visual world, meaning at a phone or a laptop or so forth. And again, the best way to do this would be to go outside, just relax your eyes, look off into the distance, looking at a horizon will automatically trigger this panoramic gaze, which is very relaxing to the eyes and will allow you to go back into a focused work bout. The one thing you absolutely do not want to do is to go outside and check your phone because if you're outside checking your phone or you're taking a break and checking your phone, you're still in that virgin's eye movement, okay? So this is very, very important because virgin's eye movements increase focus and attention and you can exploit that to increase focus and attention when you want to, but you absolutely need to relax the system. Again, for every 45 minutes in which you've been in that focused mode, you wanna get at least five minutes of panoramic vision. If you can take a 15 minute walk, even better.